All right, boom, fucking we're live. What up, yo? We got Joe Hardcore. I'm super, super excited to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for yo, coming. Thank you so much. No, nah, man, thank you for having us, man. I mean, yeah, I'm yeah. really excited to be on this. Yeah, I like your shirt. Yo, Troop thank you, man. Grappling. You know, you know about the True Path? Yeah, it's my it's boy. The, that's your boy, right? You know him, Jordan? Yeah, Rude Awakening. Yeah. Rude Awakening and shit. Hell yeah, yeah. Dude, I got the shirt off him. I got the poster and all that. He's doing really amazing things with that, with all that thing that he's doing. Inspiring a lot of people. Yeah, yeah 100%. So um, I guess we're just going to start off with uh, your upbringing. You, you're born and raised in Philadelphia, correct? Yes, born and raised. Uh, I was born on July 4th in 1980, which is like pretty epic in Philadelphia for fireworks. We have a huge, um, I, I would say a huge legacy of being like the home of you know, July 4th. So it was kind of sick, you know, and, and coming up as a kid, uh, I was born in Fishtown, lived in Kensington until my mom and dad split. And then basically I had family who lived in Kensington. I lived in Frankfurt, which New York, you guys have subways. We have an elevated train that has a little bit of a subway. Uh -huh. So we lived all along this L train, like, and, um, very loud, you know, but it was, you know, across eight different stops is where my entire family ran. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say that, you know, in the, in the beginning, it was a little hectic. I, um, we didn't have a lot of money. My, I, I, you know, my mother had me when she was 16 turned and 17, you know, mm -hmm. until she had me, she was a young maniac climbing on the L trains, writing graffiti, mm -hmm. you know, like, and then all of a sudden, boom, Oh yeah, she's gonna be a mother, and I think it was a little overwhelming. My father was not very a good person, um, very talented in woodworking, for not being a smart person. He had this idiot savant kind of way with ma measurements, mathematics, laying shit out. But other than that, he was an abysmal father, abusive, and um, eventually between. First, just fucking around with drugs, later dealing drugs, and then finally on drugs, like crack cocaine. And that really kind of put my mother, myself, and later my sister, who's three years uh, younger than me, kind of in the path that we were through from the time I would say my sister came along when I was three. By the time I was seven, we were living, me and my mother and my sister were living in that apartment next door to her aunt and uncle. And it wasn't a good neighborhood. My mom, obviously, she didn't even have a GED. So, you know, she had to make things happen for us. And, I mean, it was a lot of pancake br breakfasts, pancake dinners. You know, there was a lot of times when we didn't have certain utilities, you know. And, and I mean, we're talking, like, having to share the hot water. There was a lot of, a lot of that early on. And eventually what my mother did was she started putting herself through GED, which when she did that, she would take me to the um, library local to us in Frankfurt. And that kind of put me on the path of reading books and, and began kicking my young brain off. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother did a lot to make sure that my sister and I just got through. And the neighborhood wasn't great. Um, and we didn't have a father figure. There was dudes in and out. My mom obviously being... 22 23 she was she was the best that she could be for a young 20 year old girl you know yeah. and at some point she actually even started stripping on the side just because she couldn't keep money coming in and I, I it was a hard it was it's a weird story but it's like my mom one day came up to me she's like hey i gotta tell you this so that way if somebody in our family or someone says to me hey you know your mother takes her clothes off for a living. This is what I have to do to make sure we can afford this place. Wow. And, um, but like, that's the one side of a coin. The other side of a coin is she took us to the park whenever she could. You know, there was a lot of cool shit. I always joke around now and put a lighter side on it. Like my mom grew up into hair metal into like eighties stuff. So we had a lot of girls in my house that run around like eighties metal. So you have like, this whole different environment, which eventually would kick off everything that would be me musically because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, when she had to work on the weekends, my older cousin, whose mom and dad lived next door, would come over and watch me and my sister in return for his friends being able to play Dungeons and Dragons. Uh -huh. So you have these 80s long hair metal people who are playing Dungeons and Dragons, and I got to stay up on Saturday nights to watch Headbangers Ball. 
that yeah. was like after Headbangers Ball, you got to go to bed. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, on top of just the hair metal and the different like music and the different dudes that were coming into my mom's life, would put me on the path musically, like what I was into. Okay. And so everything kind of everything that I am is a result of the work of my mother. And there's so much early influence musically in just the shit that she exposed us to uh, from taking me to early concerts, you know? Uh, and then later just the dudes that would come in and you'd see t-shirts and it's just like the hardcore scene thing where you'd say, Oh, look at that guy's cool shirt. And you would ask yeah. him, my mother would eventually get a GED and eventually start putting herself uh, through uh, community college programs she met somebody who was from Canada, a dude named uh, Brian. And he made me a tape when she found out I, he found out I was in the heavy metal. It had agnostic front. It had carnivore. It had all this stuff. And I would, I, I, I wore this tape completely out. Mm-hmm. And um, that was like really the, the basis for a lot of the beginnings of me finding out about hardcore music. And uh, so in the, in the late eighties, we were dealing with a major crack epidemic and our neighborhood wasn't great. Yeah. Thankfully, at that time, we lived next door to my Uncle Bill, who has more guns than any human being alive. <laughs> his, in fact, his AOL name is straight up Wild Bill 357. <laughs> like, <laughs> and he's like this old former cop maniac. And that dude's the only reason why I think like we even were able to live on the block. You know, um, mm-hmm. It wasn't easy. I mean, you had no father figure, really. Uh, we had the um, early on when I was young and not in school, we'd have to sit in the welfare lines, like physically sit in the level of my mom, get uh, actual food stamps, not a card, like monopoly money looking food stamps. Mm. And I remember like going to stores and having this money in my hands and trying to hide it as I'm paying out. And then one time my friend saw me, he's like, Oh yeah, my mom's on food stamps. And then it hit me like, Oh shit. Our whole neighborhood's also on food stamps. Mm. But, um, yeah, a lot of my, a lot of my, I think a lot of the stuff that would get me excited about hardcore, and it was comes through metal and comes through, just being angry, um, at our situation, you know. And then like, it's 1990, I'm starting to grow my hair out. I'm, yeah, I play soccer all the time, but I'm listening to Metallica every day of the day. I'm starting to find out what death metal is. So I'm not making, I'm not making. A, what's that? Did you have friends who were into that scene as well? Or it was just like no. you with the tape getting into it on your own? I literally had older cousins who played Dungeons and & Dragons and their friends. And around that time, there were some people whose parents might like Aerosmith. Mm. And so I got called uh, Dusty Jokes. I had long hair. I had to fight a lot because I was literally like a pip on a dynamo, uh, domino in some classes. You know, I'm like the only white kid with a long hair. So I had to fight a lot after school and I didn't win a lot of fights. Um, my mom eventually would just say, look, you got to stop running. You got to fight these kids. I don't care if you get to fight them all one-on-one. It kind of put you on that like crazy path of like, I, it's, it's one of my things where now it's like, I, I guess like, I guess we're just going to fight right here. And I grew up also loving the 1970s uh, Broad Street Bullies era of the Flyers. Mm-hmm. I played a lot of like my Lex street hockey. We didn't have a lot of money. So we didn't have all the fucking nicest pads, you know, like we played on a corner. We never, you know, this time roller, um, what them single, uh, what are they? Um, what are them single roller blades? We didn't even have them. We didn't even have, you know, we played on our feet, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I, I kind of just started, um, uh, embodying the grab the shirt and just punch this person more than they could punch me mm-hmm. as a kind of way. And eventually these kind of kids were kind of like, all right, this crazy white dude's just not going to stop. You know, and then when like Vanilla Ice and all this shit started coming out is really when a couple people started popping their heads up. Yo, I listened to this too, but they had like short hair. Mm -hmm. My rebellion was kind of going into full thing. I had my mom was dating this guy who got me into everything from like the Ramones to this band Wasp. He was taking us to more concerts because he was in a heavy metal band. It kind of even put me further. And eventually I did meet older friends who lived on the other side of the railroad tracks. Like the L train is uh, behind my mom's house. Like one block were there. And then my friends were on the other side of the tracks, but they were like, I was 11. They were 13, 14, 15. And my mom's whole mentality was like, cause she at the time was no longer stripping. She was still putting herself through college, but she was also working at this bar and booking metal bands, mm-hmm. like hair metal bands and thrash bands. She was like, 
I don't care what you do. Go to like she would rather see me at concerts than yeah. sitting at home. She so you to go to hardcore shows. Well, I don't think that we even knew what we were going to at first. Like my first hardcore show was Sick of It All, Biohazard, and Sheer Terror opening, and it was on this street called South Street in Philadelphia. And the only reason why we knew about it was it's one of the main venues in the city and there's posters all over. So with that group of uh, older kids who were into heavy metal, I was able to go to South Street Friday nights and then sometimes Saturdays and we would all go as a group together. And you got to understand, like, I mean, you guys from New York, like that was a world away from the, the eight L stops of our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. That was like 14 stops before you got off and you're like, Oh shit, it's downtown. You know, like yeah. I only been downtown for school trips. I never just went downtown. So that kind of put me in that path. And so, uh, then it was, you're, you're looking at so much stuff. You just, it's like a whole different world. Like kind of like if someone looked at the internet in 1996, it was like, Oh my God, look at all this for us. It was like, look at this guy's patch. Look at these posters on the wall. Look at these flyers. Look at these tapes. Like you could never consume enough. Yeah. yeah. So, um, all of that led me to want to not go to my local school for high school. I took a school downtown and that was it. It was over because I had already started meeting people because we were going to shows. My friends would be eventually most of them become like basement stoner types. We might watch UFC together that like, you know, we might watch WrestleMania and stuff all together, but like I wanted to get out of the neighborhood. I mean, our, our neighborhood wasn't, the worst, but it wasn't the best. But then in the beginning of the nineties, more shootings happened. There were straight up like legit problems. Cause we weren't little kids no more. We were now in our teens. So, you know, we were long hairs in a fucking bad neighborhood. You mm -hmm. feel me? Like then what's up? Oh, sorry. To cut you off. There's actually a page on Instagram. It's called, um, Philly housing projects. I don't know if you know. Yeah. He, he documents like current events of what goes on and like, uh, like Kensington, for example. And like, yeah, you know, it's, raw. it's insane it's raw he, every post he posts is like people laying on the sidewalk like shooting up like garbage all over the place man it's i can only imagine back in the days what it was like if so on going on now you know bizarre enough um the the couple l stops huntington l stop was the big one my my mother's family and my father's family both sides of their family all live within like a city block of each other. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my mother's family left for Florida, which is ironic as fuck because they were fucking around with crack. So crack started ripping out the neighborhood where well, that came first at the time you, we were very aware across the whole, across the whole system that, I mean, there was open prostitution. There was burned out cars. If you see the first two Rockies, that neighborhood yeah. is right where all that drug shit is now. So at the end of the 70s and the early 80s, it wasn't as bad as it got. What happened is, is the drugs, the lack of jobs, and the overall fuck it, it doesn't matter if it happens in Kensington, drove the neighborhood people away from the neighbors. So that way, with the double trouble of the opioid epidemic, it's actually gotten worse. So... um in the middle of the 90s, it was wild, but it was not at this, like, infestation level. It wasn't until the beginning of the 2000s, but really sort of kicking up uh, around 2010. Mm. And it, it's orchestrated to push gentrification. Yeah. And it's orchestrated because you have a large swath of land that was built with these small row homes, 40 city homes on each side of a street so you have a hundred homes between two streets you had these industrial factories where these people were having jobs those are gone you know like all of our neighborhoods are small you had the factories that went away so you had nothing but churches row homes and hopefully your parents had jobs otherwise you're on welfare and that went that's a huge swath of Philadelphia. Like it's our city. People always come to Philly and they're like, Oh shit. It's actually really big. But it's like the people, the people that come from out of town, they go downtown or they go to certain places. Like the center of the city has always looked crazy. It's called like North Philadelphia. And like that area specifically was called the Badlands. Like, so the year 2000, Philadelphia wouldn't even get rid of 
burned out cars, broken cars. So like my childhood was playing around and like, you know, going neighborhood to neighborhood and you'd see burned out cars. You see stray dogs and crazy shit. And, um, it like just, I was, they would just leave the cars there on the street. Yeah. There's, they're not going to, they don't have the money. They had no money. What are you going to do with them? So we'd be in the cars playing around like we were in them and shit. And like, we played a lot of like, younger on, we played a lot of games like step ball where you basically throw a ball against a step. And depending on how far, uh, fall, far the ball goes, it's a single, double, triple, or home run. And we had wire ball and we had wall ball. And we just played with what the environment was because a lot of the parks was where they were selling drugs, mm. you know? And it was not easy unless, you know, like it was a very urban environment that was directly left to fester and get worse in hopes that the people who actually own homes would sell them. And a lot of the parts in the neighborhood where my mother and I were at were sold to section eight. So you get your money no matter what, it doesn't matter. So then that only made the people who did take care of their houses want to get the fuck out. So um, between 1990 and 2000, the whole neighborhood just got worse and worse. And then the people who left, they never even wanted to go back. By 2000, there was starting to be some interest by these people who were basically set up gentrification I believe they're called like the new Kensington development company. And their whole point was to bring in all the bullshit gentrification with no help to the, no help in the neighborhood. So most of the people who are living in Kensington now and Fishtown and uh, Port Richmond and Frankfurt, a lot of these people aren't even the people that were there 20 years ago. They're the, you know, like they haven't been there 40 years. There are people that are still there, but not as many. Because a lot of people who could get out got out. Everyone else died, went to jail, and now these newer people come in, and they're just as crazy, or they're they're just a trap, you know. And 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 it's just there to expose and get more people away. That's why uh, the L stop Somerset was always bad, and you never got off at that street, you know. But like um, later on, as I you know went from being like a kid to like a teenager, I moved back straight up in Kensington. So I had to walk all those blocks. I had a, and I, and I would see it. And, um, throughout my twenties into my thirties, I was living in Kensington, uh, Port Richmond area the whole time. And it just got progressively worse. You'd see hookers eating out of trash. You'd see a couple people doped up. And then in 2012, 13, they were straight up just starting to live right out in the street. Now, what happened recently, which is another huge fucking reason why you see everybody out in the streets, gentrification had come in. Houses are literally going, I'm not exaggerating, you could buy a house for $8,000 in 2002. Mm -hmm. Those houses were renovated and sold for $300,000. Yeah. They, they uh, used this um, out-of-state investment from people from New York who just were buying up houses with a 25-year tax abatement. So as this three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar house, white people start showing up. They're like, "Oh, we shouldn't have all these people living on this abandoned railroad track." Ipso facto, they get the railroad tracks cleaned up, and now the motherfuckers all over the street living under. There's a railroad track that was used to bring uh, items like industrial items across through the city and down to the river to the ports. We have a huge river port not far from there. So what happened is when the, the drugs, they would just literally live like villains on this one area. When we were writing graffiti, we knew, you know, stay together, write the shit, you know, whatever. And no, we didn't fuck with them. They wouldn't fuck with you, but they were just on dope. And the other side of the railroad tracks, the Badlands, was straight up always open hair drug sales and no one gave a fuck about it. These fucking people from out of town buying $400,000 row homes. Oh, we need to do something. So they cleaned up the railroad tracks and they literally spilled the mess all over. And that's why you see it now. That's similar actually what's going on right now in New York with this whole Corona thing. Um, people, a lot of homeless people used to live on the trains, but they have this thing now where the trains aren't, one to you, five you can't go on the train from 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. So they've kicked out all the homeless people off the trains and they're all over the streets now. And another thing is like the jail is like, they're saying they're all overpopulated or something and letting people out. You know, so there's like a lot of people coming out now on the streets that you wouldn't see before, you know, so it's like similar to what you're saying. Yeah, we, our L stopped running 
like around 12, 15 was the last one. And they have these bus shuttles. Cause I mean, obviously New York is like eight times more populated in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. So like the need for late night shit is a uh, way more of a New York thing. But like, if you didn't get on the L you had to send that bus, that bus and that was crazy, but they wouldn't let the homeless on the bus, obviously. So it wasn't as bad, but it's orchestrated. It's a way to move out poor people from an area that makes sense where they could redevelop it with no thought or care to what happens to us. Definitely you know, not. like it's bullshit. It's sad. No, it's very sad. But, um, but, but I'll tell you what, like uh, the other side of it is, is so like my group of friends would eventually be the first couple people I was meeting at shows. We would get on a bridge and Pratt, which is like the big station. The only way you get out any further, they had the buses that would go to that area. So people would meet up. This is so by L trade number eight, there's 30 or 40 of us yeah. and we're dressed in the most shitty, like, I don't know, like, uh, I would say you could call it half grunge, half punk rock, half heavy metal. No one had the money for doc Martens and there were skinheads who were running around and bait strip cut doc Martens off fresh cuts. So no one's like, Oh, we ain't wearing doc Martens. Fuck yeah. that. You know, but like you would, all the neighborhood people are finding hardcore out, all kind of found each other between 94, 95. We would all go to shows together and we're like swinging, kicking windows. Everyone's drinking on the L train. Like I wouldn't trade that chaos for anything. You know, like later on, there was a venue in Chinatown. um, And when we got kicked out of the show, it was a big fight. We all go, we fuck up this wild, wild. We get on the train, we're kicking, uh, literally we're kicking glass out of the L train. It's all plastic glass. So it just all comes out at once. Dudes are learning how to use the hydraulics under the seat to open the doors up. And it was just chaos, but it was like 40 of us on a train, like a scene out of that, you know, um, the Warriors, how they, the, um, yeah, they're jumping yeah, around. The, yeah, literally we're fucking just like fucking up the L train and that, and then we would get off, throw exit hookers, run around all night. And it was like a fun thing for us to kind of like, it was a huge part of the, the chaos factors. I think all that group of friends were all just pent up from the same neighborhood environment. But then, you know, as hardcore kind of exposed you, I got really into the culture and a lot of them dudes are kind of like, nah, I just want to sit in the neighborhood, drink beer and get into fights. So, you know, you didn't see them dudes as much, but I think the platform of Philadelphia being so crazy and the neighborhoods at where we were from kind of added this level of chaos, like why I could do some of my earlier shows in venues where all the windows would get broken out. There was like three cop cars that would come, you know, like we got away with shit and we got to live a different way, which, I don't want to fuck up your timeline, but like eventually we're the young Turks. We're all fucking maniacs. All these people doing shows in Philly hardcore, they're from the suburbs, but they had a college or they lived here and they're like, Oh, where are you guys from? We're, we're from Philly. You motherfuckers are invading, you know, like, and uh, we really, we really kind of took shit over because we were actually from here and we were fucking crazier. And there was like 40 of us from the neighborhoods. Um, I, I wouldn't trade that part for a world as much as, it kind of aggravates me that we never, like I was lucky I was in a medley gifted program. I was lucky my mother took me to a library. I was lucky that I grew up reading books and playing Dungeons and Dragons and being exposed to heavy metal. But you know, there's actual full generations of Philadelphians who lived between that entire area that never got a regular life because it wasn't available. The -hmm. schools got worse. You know, you get naturalized to a lot of, shit that human beings shouldn't have to go through, uh, you know, outward violence and uh, open drug sales and, you know, everything from like when you're a little kid, you know, who's on the L as a prostitute, you know, like it's not your average growing up and you're an average environment to grow up. So within that environment and you, you getting into hardcore, when did you realize that hardcore was this thing that you really wanted to, it was something that was going to more or less start being a giant part of your life. And how did that, help you deal with all the insanity that was going down. When I, when I lived in Frankfurt and I was like 12, 13 years old, all my boys played Dungeon Dragons. We would street wrestle. We would hang in the cemeteries and drink 40s and throw eggs and rocks at cars and listen to heavy metal in our basement. And then 
you know, straight up sitting on top of the cemetery. We hung because we we're headbangers. We can't hang at the park. We'll get fucking jumped. Yeah. So we hung in the cemetery and we threw rocks at cars and make them try to chase us. And I, I went to that biohazard sick of it all show. And it was just like, yo, these motherfuckers are crazy. And I liked that tension, scared atmosphere reminded me of just walking around down in our area when there's like six of us and we see this other group like, oh shit, is this on? Are we going to get chased? Are we going to have to... We didn't win. We ran a lot. But we knew how to climb fences and did crazy shit, you know? But like, we didn't we didn't get to... You know, like, we were the literally like the eight long hairs in an entire crazy neighborhood with like, even like the white kids were all like about blunts and like, you know, fuck y'all that. Why are you over here? Come on, crazy devil worshippers. You know, like that was our squad. Yeah. Those guys stayed in the basement of my mo- my friend's mother's house and drank more, played more Dungeons and Dragons, played more Vampire. And I just, I love that fucked up energy of shows. And music was my escape. You know, music was, you know, the classic life is bad. So you're at home with a poster covered walls, listening to music. And you're the only, I, I was like, I felt for a long time. I was the only person. I felt the way I did. I felt I was the only person that had this much anger. And then you go to a show and you'd see all this crazy shit. And then like, one of the bigger weird things that happened is at the heavy metal shows we were going to, there'd be skinheads straight up sick hiling. And you'd just be like, all right, well, we're, I mean, we're white. So we didn't like, Oh my God, this is bad. We didn't know anything. They were like, Holy shit. There's like these crazy skinheads. Mm-hmm. You know, there was not that many movies about skinheads, but we knew what the shit was. But at that sick of it all biohazard show, people are straight up jumping Nazis, and we were like, oh, my fucking God. They yeah. People fight these people? What the fuck? Like, five skinheads could go into a metal show and run the pit. I mean, like, fuck, these guys are here. This is going to suck. Yeah. But at a hardcore show, straight up jumping them, and I'm like, this is the craziest shit. <laughs> like, who does this? You know, like, and then I, as I kind of realized, like, I had a couple older friends from the neighborhood, uh, Chris, Straight Edge Chris, who works, uh, Chris X, who works at this hardcore. I literally met him when I was 13 years old, you know, like them dudes were, he's, I think he's 43 or 44 this year. I just turned 40. So he already had a little bit of a better idea what was going on. My boy freight train, they were that age. So they were a a couple years ahead of me. So they like, all right, come on, you know, stay with us. And we were all the dudes that didn't fall back in that party and in the neighborhoods and we were like, got way more immersed in hardcore. So what I didn't know, I could ask those guys, you know, and uh, our old heads became the dudes from Bad Luck 13. Mm. And they were kind of like, all right, you guys are crazy. Fuck it. We like you. And one of my boys, Bushy, his, um, he was the same age as the older dudes. He was like the scene dude. Like he knew the hardcore scene people, you know, like, so he would explain all the beefs and be like, yo, we're going to go to the show. We see a Nazis. We're going to fuck them up. I'm like, all right, that's cool. We'll fuck these guys up. I can remember Dennis and bad lucks. Like, look, see a guy over there. You guys are going to hit him, and we're going to fuck everybody up. So like being the young Turks, we had like the kind of like invincibility that a 16 year old would have. And it kind of put us into that position. And then because I had all their friends, especially Steve Bush, he had the internet, which I only had one other friend who had the internet and he had like prodigy or AOL. So Bushy was on the hardcore chat room, which I'm like, I don't understand what this is. He's like, well, yeah, you talk via the computer. And he knew about all this beeps and shit. We had no idea about. And like, we understood beeps because we had graffiti crews. Like we all had our like shit that we did, you know, everyone had corners and shit, but like, we didn't understand, like, hey, hardcore people have crews? Like, what the fuck? You know, and, like, that became a huge part of the early teens. was, like, you know, you had a lot of different small crews in Philly and New Jersey. So we started traveling because Bushy could literally get these random girls he met off the internet to literally pick him up and just drive him to shows. So we started going to shows in New Jersey, and we were going up to the pipeline in Newark, New Jersey. We're going to New Brunswick. We're going to these places. We're going to Lansdale, Pennsylvania, CeCe's and Moosick, which is like two hours away in the fucking mountains. And uh, there were a couple of our friends' bands. One of them was Kensington. Another one was uh, Forsaken Existence, who in New Jersey. We started meeting all these people from this area, and they all have these hardcore bands. And they start playing far. So, okay, I guess we're, uh, I guess we're traveling when they travel. Mm-hmm. And it really exposed us to not only the Philly hardcore scene or the South Jersey hardcore scene, but like 
yo, we went to New York and we were like, yo, this is just a different environment. You guys mosh different. People in New York smoked the entire time they moshed, which we had hall shows and shit. You didn't see that as much. There's a totally different cultural experience, but I went all in, you know, and another big part of my life was a changing factor. I was 15 and a virgin. My mom, I remember, forget it. Two years before that, we had our first boy girl party and we're all outside playing hacky sack, like headbangers. And my mom's like, why aren't you pussies in talking to these girls? <laughs> I don't know. And she's like, listen, the, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not going to use the word cause we don't want to be canceled here, but don't be at the blank. Pussy's pussy. Go for the girl with the bigger tits. And we're like, all right, cool. So we went in, that's how we started talking to girls. Fast forward to um, high school. I meet this girl. She has awesome boobs. And that ended up being the first girl I ever had sex with. Literally, I ended up knocking up a girl who was 19 when I was 15 years old. So I had to quit high school. And you got get, what's that? You got her pregnant. Yeah. Okay. So I had to quit high school, get a job at a bowling alley. We get an apartment over top of the bar where my mom worked at. My boy, Carmen, RIP, he became like my roommate. And we worked at a bowling alley. We listened to hardcore music and just was like, there was this existential dread of my life is over. But all I had was listening to hardcore music at that time. And because there was like a four month period where I literally just work, listen to music, maybe go to a show. She was really controlling because obviously I'm 16 years old. She's like 20. You can't go out. You got to work. And I remember being like, this is the end of my life. And then, they were like, yo, Agnostic Front is getting back together. <laughs> Growing up, I got told I missed everything because I never saw this band. You never saw the Pagan Babies. You never saw Turning Point. You, you, know, you missed everything. I'm like, fuck, I missed everything in hardcore. This sucks. So my mom, God bless her soul, I'm 16 years old. My boy Carmen's 18. She got us tickets to the second day of the Agnostic Front reunions in the wetlands. Right. We go up there. I see this show and I came back. I'm like, that's it. Fuck this. I'm not giving up on hardcore. I don't care what she says. Still going to do shows. Like this is my whole life. Like, you know, like that reinvigorated me. Like seeing like, I don't know why. Cause like a little kid, really 16 years old, literally like, yo man, agnostic front is back. I can't just stop going to shows. I don't care if I'm a kid. I got to still do this shit. And my life was pretty dysfunctional. Most of my childhood. So I understand a fucked up childhood upbringing. Me and her obviously didn't work out too well. And, uh, that same time frame was 1997. My mom had a lot of very wild, sketchy friends, and they let us rent a hall. I put on my very first show, March of 1997. Previous to this, we would go to different venues, and there was one venue, the Chinatown one called The Friends, where we went and see Max on penalty, and like, no one showed up. Now, mind you, in our local neighborhood, there was churches in this YWCA where like three local brands would bring 90 people. Mm-hmm. So I, me being a smart ass was like, we could bring more people just with our own bands. And they're like, he gave me these hard little fucking tickets. He's like, get me four bands and I'll give you a date. You guys could do a show. And that became the beginning of us doing shows at there. But I wasn't a band. So I got my friends bands and then we all figured out how to do it. I would later be in the worst band ever that thank God doesn't have the internet because it's embarrassing how bad it is. There's no digital recordings. No one will hopefully ever hear this band because it was just this horrible how bad we were. But we did get to play with 25 to life who never showed up. The suburban hoods who would become my boy to this J Jeff stress, TJ stress. And um, I met the dysphoria dudes. What's that? Yeah, you just as well. Well, yeah, we, I got I got him into jiu-jitsu by choking him at a, at a fest. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's how – I mean, like, I met that dude when I was 15, and now we're on the mats together as adults. Okay. But um, what happened is I put the same kind of show we had before on, and we had a hall, and that became, like, me doing shows. Hmm. And um, it was November 97. I had 25 to life, overthrow from Long Island, the dudes from New Jersey, all of our boys, and it was the biggest show I ever put on. And it was like a year later for me feeling like I'm going to die. I can't believe I can't do hardcore shows. I have to grow up. And here I am, like, rich to life, shouting me out, thanks to Joe Hardcore. And I don't care what anybody says. At that time, I go, we had gone and seen 25 to Life in New Jersey, New York, uh, Maryland, you know, everywhere. Like, he was a good person at that stage. So to me, that was like – the most rock ignition ever until 
Strength Through Unity came out, and I was thanked on the record. And I was like, oh, my God, 20 by the life. Thank me on the record. Crazy shit of my whole life. And, like, that's the little things that kept me going, booking bad shows. I mean, I was living on people's couches and sort of staying at my dad's apartment from time to time in the summer of 98 and still doing shows in Junietta at this giant expo center. Like through my life, hardcore has been like a boy Mm -hmm. through the worst, roughest seas I could have. And a lot of them I realized later in hindsight were my own having no father figure, having just like kind of this rudderless chaotic life. But hardcore at the very earliest ages became the steadiest thing in my life Mm -hmm. for better or worse. And then you talk about, yo, you know what's crazy to hear? For me, it's crazy to hear about um, you going to shows and there being Nazis there and you guys, you know, you would go to the show knowing that you're pretty much guaranteed to get into some rowdy brawl. We, we, were, we went from boots that look like jack boots because we don't get them cut off to learning to put weapons in our pants and hide them. And that was like the mid-90s. By 1998, January 98 started off with a friend of ours, Kyle, getting shot outside of the show by a Nazi. We were at a full-on war. Like, this is not self-aggrandizing, you know, but it was real shit. We saw them, we fucked them up. They see us, they might fuck us up. But you got to remember, I'm 18. People under me later on that got in the hardcore bands, they were 16, 17, but for the dudes that were running, they're 21, 22. The Bay Luck dudes might be 23. But this was our culture in Philadelphia mm-hmm. to the point where the summer of 98 – SOD, Furia 5, and VOD play the truck. The big fight inside. We all go outside. They run to the cars and start shooting at us. So we escalated to gun violence. We escalated to always having knives. And we were about that life at that age, which wasn't good because when you intensify that kind of anxiety in a younger, crazy male-driven culture, we're hyper-violent, hyper-ramped up, and we're ready for anything. In Philadelphia, actually, shows were crazy just because it was not like, oh, worry about this. It was like, no, on site, we're seeing that. But we also had a different skinhead culture. We had Atlanta City skinheads from New Jersey. They had bands, Aggravated Assault, Blue Eyed Devils. Um, then you had the Pennsylvania skinheads. You had like, we had actual gang, like it was gang shit. Mm-hmm. There, uh, later on, after American History X came out in like 1999 or something, there was like Pantera white power dudes. We were dealing with straight up punk rock skinhead gang motherfuckers. So we were like, all right, we're gangs, you know, like <laughs> that's how it came out to be, you know? Wow. How'd you get and, how'd you, how'd you get up? Great edge. It was always around us. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I remember being 15. I think there's a picture of me at 15 with like two big X's on my hands, but you know, the year before I was drinking forties and, um, drinking 40s in a fucking cemetery. And a year later when Maria was like, your whole life's over, I was drinking Corona and just thinking my life was over. So like early on, we didn't really, you know, you get exposed to shit you don't really realize. And it was actually, I mentioned earlier, Carmen D'Amico was my first roommate I ever had the first time I moved out at 16. Uh, Carmen was the coolest motherfucker. I, um, from 1990, I want to say March or no, Cinco de Mayo, 97, until December 3rd, 1999, is a period where I actually was getting fucked up. Okay. You know, my whole life was fucked up. And I was like, I, like, I literally, like, we're carrying around guns, kitchen knives in our pants. We're getting beat up. We're fighting people. Like, uh, two months before the Agnostic Front record release party, or the return of the, the reunion party before the record release party, me and Carmen got jumped at a social distortion H2O show by Nazis. So, like, we're not big dudes. Yeah, I mean, like, got to see how skinny I was at that age. So, like, we started, like, really getting into crazy shit. Carmen started dealing drugs. That was, like, my best friend. And um, in 1999, I had a decent job. I started trying to do this band, Punishment, because I just got off a U.S. tour, and we were still getting fucked up. And one day, Carmen shot himself. And the surreality of it, I remember that night, we got fucked up. I was punching walls. And the next morning, I woke up. I was like, I'm never doing any of this again. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, that was the dude that I did everything with. I don't, I don't, I don't know how to roll a blunt. I actually 
my dad put my hand over a fire because I touched a match when I was a kid. I hate even using lighters. You know, like I never smoked a cigarette in my life, smoked a, a lot of weed, smoked some dust, and drank cough syrup, cheap cough syrup in 40s. Then we get fucked up and walk around fucked up. Mm-hmm. So I literally just said that day, boom, never doing this ever again. It was like, yeah, whatever. And that was 21 years ago this year. Yeah, that's insane because a lot of people, when they go through a dramatic experience like that, like the common person, they actually go the opposite way. They, they fall onto drugs and alcohol as a way to escape reality, you know, to stop thinking about those things. For you to say, like, you stop doing that, it's, it's like, <laughs> like inspiring. Like, it's inspiring. Well, I was like 16. Yeah, I remember I was 16 years old, going to be a dad. That's when I was like, I would say, like, we were straight edge. But what, do you, how, what can a 16-year-old kid who can't get served be straight edge you know like you know what i mean so like and so you know what fuck it i'm just gonna get fucked up all the time and that was like a crazy weird entire time the summer of 98 i hit my mother got kicked out of the house had to go down to my dad's house which is like the worst experience you could possibly have at that time and uh i'm don't even want to be at his house so i'm sleeping on people's couches sleeping outside in parks with my homeboys were drinking till three in the morning mind you i have a daughter that's one going on two i'm seeing her on the weekends at her mother's house and so yeah we i was pretty much what you said about like falling into i had my falling into period and the threshold came because my main dude carmen shot himself and it broke my heart and it was like i just that summer toured in the u.s uh i drank a 40 with my dead friend now ernie powerhouse in oakland california i didn't drink that entire tour I literally didn't drink that entire tour because I was with Dysphoria. We did a whole U.S. tour. I just turned 19. And again, we talk about hardcore and the buoy. Like, I'm on tour. I don't need to get fucked up. Like, getting fucked up was the escape. And when Carmen died, that was it. It was over. I didn't want to do that no more. And that was the turning point. And I, I think things got a little bit better. I mean, but, yeah, I would say because of how I looked at my life and how I felt like I lost – I scored a 1375 on PSATs. I was smart, but I got into a lot of fights as a kid, so I couldn't go to certain schools. I was an asshole mentality because I was super angry. I didn't have the kind of platform of support because my mother had to work. She did the best that she physically could. You know, we didn't. I, I had a very large chip on my shoulder for a very long time in my life, and uh, we just made me fall asleep. Dust made me ride around in a spray painted gold girl's bike all hours of the night um and yeah like it, it just all kind of fell apart as hardcore like that like shining moment of going on my first u.s tour kind of was like the voice like you need to do a band you need to go on tour you need to stay away from philadelphia because all my friends from that first area i was telling you about where we were kicking out l windows them dudes were all growing up them dudes were all going to college and what am i doing i'm you know, we're going to tr- we're going to shows, getting into fights, hitting people with fucking everything under the sun. You know, that that summer I carried the cheapest gun on me ever, like a little twenty five, two kitchen knives, and like literally was just out for fucking chaos. And God bless that I never got really in trouble because I I could have did just ten years who got caught with that shit. Hundred percent. I was just thinking about that. Just got lucky, and we like. I also, because I was a weird headbanger, I could climb like a motherfucker. I stopped being able to run really fast, but I could literally climb. I, I wasn't good at getting down, which I broke my wrist and hand a lot as a kid, but I could climb the shit out of a fence and a wall. So shit would go down. We'd run, hide. Like, it was very good and elusive. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of breaking your hands, um, I, I saw on the BJJ United page that you broke your hand and then you kept training even though it was broken, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how well you could see it, but this pinky has a hammer pinky. I broke it one time, and they said it was broke, and it's actually a ripped tendon. Okay. I, um, I got my first construction job at 1998 with these off-the-boat Irish, which is another huge part of why I stayed drinking, was that I got on the, the first day of work, and we get in the truck afterwards, like, look at here, buddy. The only thing they don't drink on the truck is the tools. What? The only thing you don't drink on the truck is the tools. You don't drink, you sit in the back with the tools. Here's a beer. You earned it. And so I'm like, oh, I guess I'm drinking with Irish guys. And I learned to mix stucco, learned to mix cement. And so, like, I have already onset um, uh, arthritis. I have 
carpal tunnel from troweling and uh, chipping concrete and grinding shit. So I've been breaking my hands since I was a kid getting into fights, you know, like, uh, like the boxer breaks. Yeah. And so Bob from FYA is like my protege. Everything that I try to teach somebody about booking, I put into him. He does this awesome festival. For years, I'd be like, yo, I'd love to come down, but we're about to be out of work. I don't work in January a lot because of winter. So I don't have the kind of money. I'm not a baller. I don't ball off of hardcore. So it's, oh, spend a couple hundred bucks when you know you're not going to make money for a while or go down to a hardcore fest. So this year, Bob bought me a plane ticket so I go down to Florida. Yeah. The very first fucking night, the first band I mosh for, Dead Before Dishonor sends a shout out to me and I hit a pole and break my fucking hand. I mean, that night I had ice on it. What's that? They have that pole there at FYA. Yeah, I literally I, – oh, no, not at FYA because they, they moved to a bigger venue. Okay. It was like a big hall. But okay. they, the pre-show, they had a pole, a pole in this uh, small venue, and I broke my fucking hand. I mean, that night I was out at 2 in the morning at the goth club. Like, I didn't let anything stop me because you break your hand, you're wrapping ice, whatever, it gets better. So I came back, and I started training, and Jared's like, what would you do to your hand? I'm like, ah, I punched the pole. He's like, what do you mean? I'm like, ah, Mosh. He's like, all right, no big deal. You all good with it? I'm good with it. And my wife, because she's a wife, is like, please get it looked at. I'm like, nah, it's okay. And I was back to pouring concrete and setting concrete. And I was like, would hammer a concrete pin. I'm like, oh, shit, this actually hurts. So I go in two weeks after I get back from FYA, and my bone is literally snapped. And they're like, you need to have surgery. And I'm like, when? They're like, how about Tuesday? I'm like, I'm pouring concrete Tuesday. He's like, what do you mean you poured concrete? You're working right now? I'm like, yeah, I've been pouring concrete. And he's like, uh, okay, well, how about Thursday? I'm like, cool, I get to go to jiu-jitsu Wednesday night. He's like, you're doing jiu-jitsu? And uh, he like, was so aggravated that I was still using my hand. And then I showed Jarrett, and he's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? But you got like as a kid, I broke my arm, my ankles. My mom actually, they were worried. My mom was abusing me. Like I said, I climbed a lot of shit. I climbed trees, climbed fences, stitches. Like I was a, a very hyperactive kid. So I got hurt a lot. I have a crazy pain threshold. You know, like fucking out of roadhouse. Pain don't hurt. Mm-hmm. Like we didn't have a car. I broke my ankle. My mom just like, all right, we got to kind of like hold my shoulder. We had to like limp to get there. I broke my arm. We had to walk two miles at a hospital. You know what I mean? Like luckily we lived, <laughs> eventually we lived, when we lived next door to my uncle, we literally lived a block from the hospital. But like before that, yo, I, I broke my arm one time and I came home. My mom's like, your arm's broke. Oh, really? Yeah, look at it. We had a walk, you know, like they had to re-break it right there. Like early on, I broke a lot of shit. You know, I broke my nose at 12 years old. It's been broken probably eight, 10 times now. Had surgery twice. Rebroke it right after surgery. Like I'm stupid. But, you know, that's insane. And now you're into jiu-jitsu. So how, how'd that come about? So Jarrett is a – what's that? What's that? How'd you first get into jiu-jitsu? Um – Getting into was hanging out with the headbangers and being at Blockbuster and seeing this UFC VHS and taking it home and being like, this is the craziest shit on earth, which then we then watched pay-per-view the next time it came on, which is UFC too. Mm. Juxtapose this with going to hardcore shows, one young Jared Wiener being at the shows in the pit and someone being like, yo, that dude trains jujitsu. And we are like, oh shit, he's always crazy. (laughs) <laughs> like we're like oh shit he's always crazy so like uh jared years ago jared's my old head in hardcore years ago outside the truck and i'm like yo let me see some jujitsu he's like come at me i'm like okay and he straight up hit tossed me on a concrete gave me a concussion <laughs> he's like yo i felt so bad man you're my young boy but like so we knew it existed but i got the money for jujitsu i didn't even think like i could do jujitsu and um, I had a lot of friends from the 90s hardcore scene, 2000s hardcore scene, who got very involved in jujitsu. And um, I'd done American Kempo as a kid. We all got taught how to box. Uh, but, you know, I never thought to me that I could do jujitsu. Mm-hmm. And fast forward to my late 30s, I'm married. I'm working at an oil refinery, running a job. I'm getting fat because I'm the boss of the job. I have like two 45 minute lunches. I got a three hour commute. I, I gained a lot of fucking weight and I'm outside of the, sh- I'm inside a show and H2O Adam, I told the story on the Instagram, but we did a show at the basement of the church, obviously. And Adam's like, 
there's a guy outside with a baseball bat and a hoodie. I was kind of like, oh, all right. And, you know, I had a lot of friends at the show. So I thought, oh, we'll go out and check it out. It was the end of the show. We have to sweep, clean, mop the floors before we can leave the venue. That's what's so cool about the church. We get a hall, we turn it into a mess, and then we have to get rid of the mess and return it. It's like a, it's actually like a ritual stake. Like you get to use this place, but you have to take care of it. And it like infuse a lot of cool shit. So I realized at some point, all right, I don't hear no one getting killed. So maybe everything's good. So I go up the steps of the church. And as soon as I go outside, I hear, yo, motherfucker. And this guy comes at me with a baseball bat. And I told my dudes, hey, stand back. I'm like, yo, chill out, man. You got racks. So then I go in the trash and I threw a bottle at him, missed, threw another bottle, hit him in the face and ran and grabbed him around his chest and picked him up and slammed him on the ground. Now, obviously, because I'm kind of a fucking retard goon, I had worked the door at the bars. I got taught how to like safely take people to the ground and that kind of stuff from like bar bouncer training that they give you, you know, but like I was a door guy most of the time, you know, like, so I knew enough to take people out of shows. So I knew how to pick somebody up and slam them on the ground. Yeah. There, after that whole situation was disposed of, Adam and Toby were like, Jared has to give you an honorary belt for that. That was great street jujitsu. And there was a guy from BJJ United who was there. Who I was like, yo, what do you think? He's like, no, that was exactly what you should do in jujitsu. And now I understand it. I basically ran up, got under hooks, literally slammed him, and stayed in full mount. I didn't pummel him. I told him, like, dude, I love you. You got to calm down. You know, I had to hit him a couple of times, like, yo, chill out. But I like, just maintained Mount and was like, yo, you need to chill the fuck out. And it definitely threw me through a loop because I might get into, like, some stupid shit, but I haven't been in real back-and-forth fights in a while. I've kind of not grown past it, but socially I don't put myself in them positions often. Hmm. So I was like, man, are we at this stage where young kids only want to throw hands? They just want to hit you with a bat? Hmm. And then I'm like, are they that afraid of me? Because, like, old shit? Like, what the fuck? And um, I texted Jared. He's like, dude, I heard you're doing some jujitsu down there. Like, fuck with me. And I talked to him about it. And he's like, dude, I think you should try it. He's like, it, it doesn't hurt you to learn. And it could, you know, obviously look at the situation. You're still in the mix with all this crazy shit. My wife went behind my back and bought a gi at, from the school. And uh, I got bad concrete burn on my knee the week I was going to start. Like when you get concrete burn, it looks like the worst scab you've ever had, but it's wet. It's like a, like a wet healing scab on my knee. So when we did the wisdom and chains already dead video, it's a bunch of dudes from jujitsu and Jared's like, what are you ever going to train? Your wife bought that gi a month ago. I'm like, look at my knees. Like don't put that knee on my mat, but when that knee heals, you better get your ass on the mat. And that's really what got me to take the leap into jujitsu. That's probably the best thing I've heard all month. And I'm so, I'm, that just made my day. It's like it literally was like literally like a lightning striking at the perfect time. Like I was depressed. I've 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 dealt with depression and uh, suicidal tendencies for most of my life. I didn't have that outlet anymore from that rush. Like yeah, I can mosh and kick somebody. There are some times where you're like, I start moshing, people stop moshing. I'm like, all right, maybe I'm either too crazy or maybe it's not the time for me. Like I don't get that play like the younger kids get to play anymore. You know, like. Stage dives hurt when you land bad, you know, plus I facilitate a lot of these shows. So I don't have that same mosh for five bands uh, energy expelled, you know, and I pour concrete for a living, but that's like, this is what you do to make money. This is how you feed your family. This isn't like, I feel so great. I just straight edged all this concrete. This is like, oh, this is what you had to do for a living. So you don't get that cathartic release physically. Yeah. yeah. So jujitsu just gave me that. How was your first time rolling? So I was never concerned about it, to be like honest, because I was just heavy. I was like a fat person and I hadn't been fat my whole life, but I was like in the two sixties, almost two seventy. And jujitsu's fucked up. Cause we don't, Jared's doesn't have like a step. You don't just show up on your first day and they reset the jujitsu clock to this is class one. Yeah. You show up and that day it's whatever they teach you. And you're like, ah. so I'm like, this guy's got his coat wrapped around my neck. I don't really understand it, but I like the teaching atmosphere of BJJ United. I like the team aspect of it. So the first time I go, they're uh, here, don't roll, but watch. And I kind of saw it. I was like, I don't really understand what's going on, but fuck it. I'll try it. So then my first time rolling, I was just fat and out of weight, like out of shape, but I was heavy and tall. 
So if I could get on top of the guy, I would just squeeze like over hook, under hook, and just like so I got swept a lot. And then I had a lot of shoulders in my face. Yeah. We're old school pressure passing. So immediately someone's whole shoulder in my face and I'm like, I don't really like this, but I know how to get out of it. And instead of being like, like, Oh, I didn't do good. I realized like, yeah, I fucking suck at this. Mm -hmm. And, um, the first month I started at the end of June, 2018, I was on a vacation with my wife in Maine in August of 2018 and hard Carl, who's like a legendary hardcore dude owns a tattoo shop in DC builds tattoo machines like an old school fucking hardcore dude who we grew up with moved back to Philly. Yeah, he started training. Well, right? Yeah. He started training. So I'm in Maine and I see a picture of Carl's first class and I'm like, fuck yeah, Carl. Yeah. Like I have a, like, and that was it. I had like, Carl is like my life partner now. Carl's like my best closest friend. I literally like he, he trains Monday mornings at 1130 AM. I'll be at work. He'll text me. Class was brutal. Here's who I roll with. This is a technique. And then I, I go to Tuesday night classes and I'd be like, yo, here's what we did. And then we would meet together on Thursday night, a half an hour before class. And he's like, this is what they showed me. And I would show him what I learned. Mm -hmm. And we would pair up on Thursdays and like having that, I mean, he's, he's 10 years older than me, but he's, he's about the same size, a little bit taller. Same thing, heavy as shit, out of shape, old hardcore dude, mentally not all there, but just like needs something. And that was like a drive. I had like a, Oh yeah, well we're also a tattooed fucking goon maniacs. And that was really with you know, you gotta figure within six weeks of starting, I had like a partner like that, you know, that yeah. I could go through all this with. Since you started training jiu jitsu, have you noticed like a change in your like mental state? Like you're talking about growing up, like having suicidal tendencies, being so aggressive. Like, do you see that like peaceful side to jiu jitsu being like this warrior in a garden like type of deal? It's heavenly. It's literally, it, it was the balance that I always needed and never saw there. Um, at a show, I'll leave it at, at a show, because there's like two of these moments where like some kid was getting way too crazy. And I'm at one point, he's like ripping my shirt. I didn't hit him. I kick, like, like front sweep his leg. I go knee on belly and I'm like, please let go of my shirt. And everyone's like, I'm like, don't hit him. Just let go of my shirt, please. And the bouncers took it away. And I was like, dude, you all right? And I'm like, yeah, why? Because I knew he wasn't going to punch me. I had his arms. I had my knee on his stomach. That sucked for him. Like, jiu-jitsu gives you that normalized piece of, oh, you want to struggle? Cool, I do this for fun. So where are we at now? Let's do this. You know, like, um, I, needed, I need an outlet. I need a mental outlet. I need a physical outlet. I need to be challenged. And I hadn't been challenged with, like, you need to get better. Um, and, and, you know, so back to the breaking the hand. I break my hand. I'm, I'm worried, you know, oh, it's, you know, this is a slow season for work anyway. So I'm like, ah, it, it, that'll be what it is. I was like, Jarrett, can I please train? He's like, you cannot live roll, but you could take any class. You just, I don't want to see you fucking rolling. So I don't have work. I was in jujitsu every single day that a hand was broken. Any class I could physically get to Monday morning. Sometimes Monday morning, Monday night, if my wife wasn't home or Monday morning, sometimes Monday morning, Tuesday morning, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, like Thursday night, like anything I could go and do just to stay immersed. I have a book, write down the technique. And then because my hands broke, I'm typing the technique, put left hand here. <laughs> like, you know, like I know that if I was exposed to jujitsu at the time when Jarrett and I went the part of me that sought violence would have been found because of Jared's school being Maxwell and the fact that they were still doing Gracie challenges and they're still striking. I probably would have benefited at that point, but it wouldn't have been the saving grace in my late thirties. Like I needed it to be. Hmm. I wasn't happy. I haven't been like, there's existential happiness. Why are we breathing air? What's the purpose to all this? And dude, I have a cool dog. I have a beautiful wife. I have a job that lets me make money so I don't have to depend on hardcore shows to be my reason how I eat and put a roof over our heads. And yet there's still like an emptiness that just is always going to be there. And I don't have that problem. You know, it's Monday. I had too much shit to do. I didn't get to go to class night, which is Monday's like, ah, it doesn't matter. There is no missing Tuesday class. Like I'll miss a show or be late to a show than not miss Tuesday class. Like I have like rules that you just do like, 
you know, like I try to not book shows on Tuesdays and Thursday nights just so I don't have to don't, like, oh, I don't know. I don't want to miss class. That's it, where I'm at in my life. It definitely becomes like an obsession and a passion and something that just really brightens up your life in a way that's as weird as it is to say to anyone who doesn't like, undescribable how much it, it elevates your life. Well, you kiss. There's a kinetic energy that comes from the physical movement with a person. And once you're inoculated to how a human being feels, like if you're in, if they're in your side mount and their shoulders in your face, it's aggressive, but there's a physical bond. We agreed upon that you will put your shoulder in your face if you need to, and I need to get out of it. And it presents you with an option. How do I get him off me? Do I grab his pant leg and try to go to a half guard? Do I think I'm strong enough to, you know, like it's a puzzle and it's an agreement between two people that, hey, we have enough respect for each other that we're going to exude violence, but we're not going to take it to a, a burning threshold point where we had to go to fists. Mm -hmm. So it's a hard game. Uh, Saturday, a really cool dude named Majed from our school who literally has this much of an arm. This is where his stump ends. Okay. He had a weird takedown. We both landed odd. I landed on my head, sort of, because I couldn't break fall. <laughs> he lands on me. And he, like, he's got his weight on me. He's like, dude, are you good? I'm like, a little starry, but yeah. He's like, yeah, man, that kind of hurt. I'm like, let's do it, though. And he's in side control. But, like, where else when you're doing this shit do you both fall? And then someone's like, hey, are you cool? All right, I'm going to go back to hurting you now. Like, what? <laughs> what the fuck are we, like – you know, like there's a surreality that it also ended me with trying to arm bar that stump, which I will tell you is, I don't know how you arm bar a stump. There's no way to flex in your. Yeah, that's how we. I like arm bars are easy for me to get. I, I transition them well, and he stuck it out, and I'm like, fuck it, stepped over, put the thing, squeeze my legs. I'm going trying to like get the stump. Like, like I, I cannot do this. And he's like, dude, and he goes, if I had an arm man, totally would have tapped. <laughs> like you don't get that in any other environment, man. Like. You don't get – and our school, obviously, is very old-school pressure passing. If you've never been to BJJ United, I have a lot of friends because of jiu-jitsu that are from hardcore, and I have a lot of friends that – one of the guys in my that I grew up with three blocks away was in a band with him later who played in a band horror show, and we did one show as a band called The Crossbearer. He's a black belt under 10th Planet, and he runs the Ventura. He owns uh, 10th Planet Ventura. He moved to California in the 2000s and started his life over. And he's a fucking 10th Planet Black Belt. Uh, the girl who videotaped all the shows from like 98, 99, 2000, Jamila, moved to California. She's a brown belt under, um, I can't say her name right, Leah Vera. She's the most, the highest degree female black belt in the world. Okay. She's a brown belt. She's competed at Fight to Win. Like, I have friends from the 90s that are getting back into it. It's like, I can't believe you guys are doing jiu-jitsu. Maybe I need to get back to it. And that was the other thing is when we were touring, you talk to a guy who's doing jiu-jitsu and he'd be like, yeah, I toured my ACL. And I'm like, if I, don't, if I do that, I don't have work. Like, you know, like there was a deterrent when hardcore people started doing it. To, all I'm hearing is elbows getting pulled out. And I'm like, yeah, that, that means I can't make money. You know, I toured with bands. I came home and I either got a job building shit, making shit, and then later, when I got into the union, it was just concrete work. So there is no, oh, yeah, this guy tore my, I got to get my shoulder. Re like, no, that means I can't work. Yeah. So that was a huge deterrent with my friendships. Uh, Matt Pike, who's a booking agent. Rich Thurston, who's in a ton of straight edge bands. The list goes on and on of hardcore dudes who in the early 2000s were doing jiu-jitsu and getting hurt which now I know understand culturally because the Gracie schools were like, yeah, kill, get. And there wasn't that uh, we need to protect these people. It was like, fuck it. Who cares? So they get their arms smashed. You know what I mean? So like, um, it heart, uh, hardcore still supplements a lot of my social interactions and a lot of the mind work of booking shows and the busy body of being on phones, getting bands. But jujitsu is the, like my silent personal like journey. Like, you know, like me and Carl got our blue belts together and we had coffee afterwards, and he's like, what do you think? I said, we've got at least a 1,000 days of being getting our ass kicked. He's like, you think a 1,000? I'm like, maybe more. I just think it's going to be at least a 1,000. That's what in my head. You know, like, it's a silent thing. And you don't worry if a guy, oh, this guy got his blue belt, and, you know, he's better than me. Yeah, look out. He's fucking 10 years younger, 15 years younger. He's fucking ripped. You know, like, 
it's our team is so fucking great that you come to BJJ United, which is the point I was getting back to. You got to start class together. You bow in, you line up, belt order, all right, boom, start in class. End of class, you line up, tie your belts, and there's this quiet. There's no, we don't really roll to music. There's a quiet sense of hearing the entire class panting, even the black belts. <sighs> and everyone's tying their belts like, you're, you real, I realized that early on rolling, I'm not the only person out of breath. I'm not the only person tired. I'm not the only person who's looking for the energy to tie your fucking belt. And then, like, there's no water bottles on the mat and deciding not to – I don't know what would happen if someone's like, I'm, I'm just tired. I'm not rolling this round. I, I've never seen it at our school. I don't even understand what would happen. Like, my whole head would explode. It's just accepted that you are going to roll because it is time to roll. Pick a partner. If you're tired, you better get on top. You better get a good-ass defense game. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's my game right now is, uh, this guy's going to take me down. This is going to suck. Maybe I'll get better when it escapes. Remember underhooks. I'm really bad with remembering underhooks. Yeah. My, uh, one of my coaches, uh, Luis Cabrera, he, um, he has actually a, like, a, like a website and a saying. He always says, beware of the underhook. I, I just I, – it's so – I'm not a wrestler. In fact, I, I, learning that wrestlers were so strong – we were soccer dudes. We made fun of wrestlers. Yeah. You ever see that scene in Billy Madison where Billy Madison writes the guy who uh, would eventually shoot the guy who was going to kill him? He's like, I'm sorry for everything I did and get him a phone call. I want to do that to every wrestler me made fun of in high school because they're kings. They're already they – like I, I did not know that that is what I should have did instead of playing soccer in high school. You know, because although this area and obviously in New York, wrestling is a big thing. So a lot of these guys coming in are wrestlers. <laughs> They're just innate to destroy you. And I'm like, so I have to learn, oh, shit, remember this underhook, you know? Jiu-Jitsu is an experience for me that, you know, I could have rested on my laurels and be like, back in my day, we kicked people's asses. I now look at one of our best coaches is a dude named Lobster. We're like, if Jared's still on the podcast talking to JT Torres, that dude's getting shouted out. He doesn't compete. He's one of the best teachers we have. And he's a fucking problem. He's super dangerous. It's actually the most painful person in the like unilaterally you know, like he's probably the most dangerous person to roll with. And he's the most nice person. Jiu-Jitsu taught me that when I was young, I'm like, oh, this guy looks like a pussy. Yeah. There is no person looking like a pussy on a street that you should actively seek violence with because you really don't know if they're a purple belt or a brown belt or black belt and will fucking break your wrist. 100%. Yeah. It's a lot of things, man. It's a lot of things. And then you then take this jujitsu culture, you put it on top of hardcore, and you got the internet. Now you have people that I've, I have, you know, I'm getting old now. I'm not cool on Twitter, man. You know, like, I don't want to be on Facebook arguing about shit, so I'm on the Twitter and Instagram. And now I've got young hardcore kids like, yo, how'd you start jujitsu? Or like, dude, like, dude, I can't believe you trained. You know, like, it's a new thing to keep me excited about both hardcore and jujitsu. Oh, good. No, I think, because uh, we've had a few jujitsu guests from uh, Bronx Jiu Jitsu from the gym. And a lot of what they've had in common with a lot of them brought up was um, like they used to fight so much outside, but since they've started training jujitsu, they don't even look for fights no more. Like they've come to the point where they have this confidence, not like a cocky confidence, but they know their ability and they know there's no point in showing it to anybody. Like they know what they can do to the regular person outside. You know? so. Well, that's, that's the, that's the struggle of ego and pride in a young man is like, in this social interaction, in a social inter incident, I have to stay on top. I have to be the person that wins. And there really is no winning if this guy pulls out a gun and shoots you. Yeah. And I started grasping that as things became more honest and real. Like my, my wife, I met her while I was on tour as a younger. She moved to California. I am a father. My kids are older. They don't live with me. But like, if I get hurt, she, what is she going to do? You know? And then also like, cool, I can roll around in the street and fight with this idiot. You know, like I learned from bouncing at clubs what it was worth it, what wasn't. And not that the fight isn't in me anymore, but in jujitsu, I just look at, you can look at the situation from a different angle. Like, oh, this guy's getting aggressive. Well, I need to watch what he's up to. Because before I was like in a Jocko's term, default aggression. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get violent, I'll wait. I'm not going to wait for you to hit me. I might as well just hit you and let's just have this fight. Yeah, You know, like, 
but that's the goon shit. As you get into jujitsu, you realize like, I don't need to do all this. Like, you know, Oh, you're mad at me. Like I don't get upset half of the time. Cause I'm like, Oh man, that guy really has a hard life that he's upset with somebody over something like whether it's in a store, a rude gesture or driving. Like, fuck you. I was never a guy who would pull over, you know, but like jujitsu taught me that any person on the street has a better chance of fucking me up than I realize. And also why, why expose myself to that level of potential violence? Because dude, I never rolled around the ground. I might, I poke you stick. I was a very dirty fighter, fish hooks, eye pokes, no problem. Head butts, which is why I got scars on my head. Look at how beautiful my fucking nose is. That's why I'm getting my teeth redone. Cause I had them uh, so loose from fighting. You should seek to not want to be a fighter, you know, and the hardest dudes in jujitsu are the least likely to be fighters, you know, and you can see it in a lot of that. And it's kind of cool. It's a peaceful thing. We don't have shit talk. I know your school's like that too. There's no shit talking. There's no, we don't say when we're getting our geese off, yo, did you see me? I tapped that guy out. You don't talk like that. It's just that one moment where you did something that person didn't do. There's a humility and there's a pecking order. Saturday, I went to Jared's class. It's the first time since COVID started. I go against a hard blue belt who made me eat shit and tap me like six times in six minutes. The best thing I can do when someone taps me is stand back up. Be like, all right, let's go again. And try yeah. to not look like I was tired. Like, yeah. all right, fuck you. Let's do it again. Yeah. Did that two rounds of two separate dudes smashing me. And then I rolled with this dude who's a white belt. And I did that to him. And I'm like, see, this is the pecking order. <laughs> like, you know, I get him. I get got it's a, there's a, there's a beautiful cycle of it, you know? And I appreciate jujitsu for teaching humility and teaching you to better yourself. And it's like, cool. I get in this fight. I'm going to get arrested. You know, Jared being a police officer, be like, why did you get into a fight in the street? What are you, what are you being done for? You know, like you want to hold yourself to a higher expectation. Plus, as I learned with him breaking my hand, cool. Less time rolling. You know, yeah. I didn't have a live role, like a hard live role. All of, 2000 actually I, there was like two classes i hit the week when my hand got better and cleared so i had two classes where i had maybe four rolls each class and then it was covid so uh, until covid you know i had eight rolls like actual full speed hey don't watch my hand kind of deal so like i'm i'm eight months behind my yeah. timing is still off you know like i can't jeopardize that by getting a fight with some dude who's mad at me yeah cool be mad at me fuck off i'm hoping that Whenever things clear up or whatever, because I know that uh, people at the Bronx Jiu-Jitsu are planning on going over to BJ United for a day or whatever. So I'm hoping that when I go, I can meet you in person. And we oh, we love we love that. We love that. Yeah, you we'll look small. You look small and like someone who's going to get out from under me and smash me. So I look forward to being slow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what do you say to the people who are thinking about trying it or like kind of on the fence? I tell everybody the same thing. It's a trust fall. You either show up and act like a bitch and be like, I don't think this is for me. I, we, um, the, the stress thing, ready? So it's stress, like, oh, I'm not doing jujitsu. And I get behind him and I put him in a rear naked choke. He's like, what the fuck, man? And he's like, he'll say it didn't happen, but this is the real truth. It's in Maryland. His band activate played and Shattered Realm was going to play. And he's like, I'll just get my gun. I go, you get your gun ready. We're going to go at the same time. I'll choke you before you can get your gun and shoot me. <laughs> like, you know, so we get in, I have my hooks in, I have my overhook. I'm ready to go. <laughs> He's like, dude, fuck this. I got to start going. Like more and more we inoculate, not through that means, but we tell our friends, like, this is why we're doing it. Come hang out. Hard Carl's lost 60 pounds. I've lost 60 pounds. Big black Dennis from bad luck. That motherfucker is trying to get down to 290 just so we can come back to rolling. We had to buy him like a six X key so we could start it. Like this is the path to better, better, better physical health, better mental health. But on top of it, what do you got to lose? Somebody guy lays all over top of you. You know, like I tell everybody, you got to just try it. And I've had friends that come, they do the checkout class and they roll and they go, I don't know, man, this is crazy. I don't know. How do you do this after work? I don't care. I'd rather be tired. You know, I believe in naps. I come over work two, three o'clock. I nap. I stretch, I get ready for jujitsu, and I fucking go. I don't care if I'm tired afterwards. I would rather be tired and barely walking. Then I tell them, the worst two days of your life is the first two days you go to jujitsu. And as long as you stop eating like a fat fuck, it gets easier. Yeah, I actually, um, during quarantine, I had my friend, he got Walmart masks, like the, the puzzle mask. 
we duct taped them because they kept coming apart. And I had like uh, my friend start training with me. We ended up, well, we trained a lot during the quarantine, just in my garage, just me and him. Uh, we had like my computer set up. We'd play like King Nine and like a bunch of bands. Yeah. Oh, and then uh, I showed him, like he didn't know, like he knew nothing, right? So then I showed him like everything well, that I could in the meantime that I knew. And then now he actually trains a bunch of jiu-jitsu. He goes twice a day, every day that he can go, and he loves it. That's, that's the important thing is it gives you a chance to expose people to what you've been exposed to, and you're paying it forward, you know? Like with, with Jordan with his true path thing. Like, yes. I mean, Jordan, Jordan's always been an aggressive, smart person, very active. And then, you know, I start doing jiu-jitsu, and people are like, yo, you know Jordan? Is, you know this person? Is, and you start looking at all these different people. DFJ – who played drums in Rival Mob. He plays in all these different bands. The motherfucker's a black belt in jiu-jitsu and owns his own jiu-jitsu school now. I was on the phone with him. I, I just called him. I was like, you do jiu-jitsu? He's like, fuck yeah, I do. <laughs> I think about, he's like, yo, I think about opening up my own school, man. You got to come up and train. I'm like, what? Like, you know, like, there's all these paths that lead back to hardcore. You know, um, Gian from King Nine trains with Con Gracie. I didn't what? know. It's blowing my mind right now. Yeah, he like I from Biohazard trained, like you trained, like but I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, Jotham Jotham from Wisdom of Chains is a purple belt. Billy from Biohazard is a black belt. Dude, there's uh Roger from uh Roger from Agnostic Front, his wife is a jujitsu um Gracie Jiu Jitsu instructor. He trains um Gavin from Burn. He tra- like, there's so many people that train in jujitsu and it's because that kind of stuff r- is relevant to people like us. Yeah. In our in our school, there's like a dude. He literally Davey shows up and he'll wear like a throw like a throwdown hoodie or like a hatred hoodie. And we're like, damn, sick shirt. We go, what's up? But he just had a kid, so he hasn't been coming in. Yeah. But Brandon, he's a young wrestler who's more from the Christian hardcore side of things. He'll be like, dude, so what's up with the fest? Yo, do you think uh, we'll get this band? There was a band from here called Dark Day Dawning. The singer is a purple belt. He's super good. There's a, a white belt dude who ran the first website message board at our school. All these people, we all came together jiu-jitsu. We started looking, oh, shit, what are you doing here? Oh, shit. You know, like, next thing you know, you're finding all these people through hardcore that are also involved in jiu-jitsu. And it's, it, it goes on and on. There's tons of hardcore people. True Believer is a school in Pittsburgh. Uh, <laughs> not only Jake, True Believer, Mosh is hard as shit. And he's a black belt. Jamie from Code Orange. Justin from Code Orange. I think everybody but one person in Code Orange train. In what? fact, I think Jamie is not far from getting his brown belt. What? Goldman's a blue belt. Jamie's a black belt or a purple belt. Jamie actually fucked up Hard Carl in Philly. I'll talk shit on Hard Carl for fighting an arm bar for two minutes instead of just tapping and resetting. And Jarrett told his coach, yo, man, he's looking good. And Jamie got a purple belt. You know, like there's yeah. people all over training. And our, so Josh White from Florida, he trains with uh, Gracie Tampa. He just got on a competition team. Like, there's tons of people that get involved with this. You know, the thing is, is I think that as a hardcore culture, everyone's in their own gyms. And unless you post something on Instagram, you don't know. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's, 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 it's alive and well. Oh, the dudes from Bulldoze, Mike, the, the purveyor of the greatest rips of all time. Mike's a blue belt in jiu-jitsu. Mick G, I think he's a purple belt. Um, yeah, like, oh yeah, the singer of Agent of Man, uh, he's a purple belt. Yeah, he came, he came to this hardcore. I'm like, yeah, you stopped at purple. He's like, yeah, I've been training in three years. I'm like, you stopped after purple? Like, it blew my mind. Yeah. My boy, my boy George. <laughs> you gotta, so you, many people. You gotta watch out when they go to this hardcore that's surrounded by jujitsu specialists. Mike Wilson, who runs Gorilla Jiu-Jitsu in North Jersey, is like, yo, you gotta do this as Jiu-Jitsu. I follow, yeah, I follow their account too. They look, they, I love their gym. It looks really cool. They're part of the tag team thing too. Yeah, uh, Mike Wilson trained under Henzo and eventually got his black belt under Jarrett. They're mm-hmm. out in Mawa, which is like the left corner of New Jersey. We were there for the school opening, and uh, yeah, that's the thing. Is like, I like that now. I'm like, yo, man, we should travel up to Manchester, New Hampshire, to train in heavy metal jujitsu. Like, you know, like, yo, I'm in, C- I'm, in, I'm in St. Louis. Actually, fucked up. I break my hand Friday night. I was supposed or Thursday night. I was supposed to train Friday morning at the Gracie school. Mm-hmm. And I packed a fucking gi and no gi shit. So I got, like, two pairs of, like, clothes and all my jujitsu shit with me. I couldn't even fucking train because I broke my hand. I was so bummed. 
You know, like, so my, my luggage was 90 jujitsu, 10% close. Yeah. You know, like that's what it does to you. Yeah. hundred percent. 100%. Yo, so it's been an hour and 20. So, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for this. I enjoyed it more than, than, you know, I'm going to re-listen to this a few times because I just <laughs> love this conversation. Um, Tell people about real quick before we end this your like podcast that you're doing and stuff like that. So we are currently in the beginning stages of recording. I'm really weird about this. I, I was pen. I was a little pensive about even doing one. I don't like being a, I am that fucking punk rock dude. Oh, everybody's doing it. I don't want to do it, mm. but I like being on podcasts and I have a lot of friends who do cool ones, but then and I'll be honest. I don't want to do a podcast where I go, Hey, Scott Vogel. Let's open the new record. Yeah. Don't, I don't want to listen to that. Yeah. It doesn't dry. Like I listen to weird podcasts, obviously the JREs, the Jock, the Jockos, but I also listen to Lex Friedman's artificial intelligence. Like I listen to a lot of audible books. I, li- I listen while I work. Cause a lot of times I'll by myself, you know? So I want to be, st- I want to hear a story about someone's life. I don't really care what their next t-shirts coming out. So uh, one of the, guests who will be in the first episodes we were talking about what are you going to name it i'm like i have no idea and he's like i would brand it under this is hardcore just because you've got a solid social media and i mean obviously look at my track record my festival this is hardcore my show bookings philly hardcore shows and joe hardcore presents super creative when it comes to uh naming shit so we're gonna we're gonna do i have three more to record in the next week we're going to lay out, get it all set up. So that way, when we start loading them, we're going to do load two and then we'll be able to release weekly and kind of see what's going to happen with it. But the thread that we've gone with is talking to people who have learned things that are DIY and either impose them in their daily life, in their careers that are not involved in hardcore or, Hey, this is how I learned to do this. And this is why I'm very good and why I'm still doing what I'm doing in hardcore because this is what I did. And we're not, I mean, we're not talking about online shit. We're talking about how, like for me, when I was a promoter, as a kid, I hand wrote letters to bands. I literally hand, I have letters from Jamie, D, uh, Jamie Hapriot. I have letters from Scott Vogel. Hand wrote, I would like to book your band. Shit don't happen no more. We're like in the dark ages. And uh, I want hardcore kids now to be inspired who feel like, you, know, you see this word gatekeeping thrown around by these young kids. It's like, We had to physically do everything by hand. We had to do this harder than you guys have to. You have the internet. You're attached to every human being involved in hardcore. How quick did I respond to you when you wrote me? How quick did we set this up? Yeah, pretty quickly. We have the assets, the information, and the will, or the the will, but these kids don't have the information. Like, oh, I can actually learn how to do this because of podcasting. That I, in my two weeks since I bought this shit and got everything start rolling, I started learning how to mess with the audio more and do these things because I usually I get somebody to help me like, hey, you want to help me? Cool. Okay, I'm just going to do this part. You have to do all the technical stuff and I don't want to even ask you. Just do it. And then I don't learn how to do it and then I'm dependent. If somebody can't do something, it's not the way to do this. So with this is my own task of doing this more of myself, which is why I have this setup because I'm trying to get used to doing this. But the it's a, this is hardcore theme podcast. It's going to be named this hardcore podcast. Uh, and the, and the, at least the first 10 guests, cause we've got them all lined up and I've just been knocking them out as I can do them after work and such. And with their schedules, cause most of ours are at least two hours or so are talking about the inspiration that came from punk rock, the drive, the DIY. And some of like, I mean, some of these people have excelled and pushed hardcore to a higher level because of what they learned. Other people took, what they learned and put it into their work life. And, I, and that's more interesting for me to listen to. You know what I mean? Like that's what I want. That's what I want to put on my headset and forget that I'm troweling concrete or chipping concrete all day. And that's kind of what I want to put out into the world. And then we'll mix it up with a couple like, Hey, quick updates, you know, and we'll take it from there. I'm not trying to get too crazy with it. Um, but that's the ultimate goal. Awesome. So you're doing, you're doing jujitsu. You're pouring concrete. You're doing a podcast. You booked the This Is Hardcore Fest. You put sunflowers in your backyard. Love them. They're actually fucked up. I actually bought these things. They're so big. I have to tie the things up again. It's it, one's fifteen foot already. 
craziness. Yeah, see, I've I- never had a backyard this big. Do you understand this? I've never, and I don't have a big backyard. I've got another house lot next to me. So we have like two, what two city backyards would be and the lot next to me. I think I'm a fucking farmer. <laughs> like, I don't know shit. Like, I, I, I like, you know, like literally somebody just got shot last Sunday. There was 30 bullets. Thank God I was picking my wife up. I didn't see it. Like I have like a hood paradise right here. You know, like I'm just happy that we have this. I never had a propane girl till this, my 40th birthday just had passed. My wife bought me one. Like, I think I'm living out in the suburbs. Really, it's it's still hood. It's still crazy. I'm still in the city. So yeah, I I always thought sunflowers were the coolest thing, and we drive on tour and see them. And I was like, yo, fuck it, I'll just see if I could grow them. <laughs> and this is like year two of it. That's awesome, bro. Oh, thank you so much, man. Yo, thank, thank you so much for coming. On thank the you show. for the questions. Thank you for prying into more than just the average stuff. Well, sure, yeah, Obviously, I love talking jujitsu, so I appreciate that too. That was my favorite part. I fucking <laughs> so awesome, yo. Everything you said. Everyone at my gym has been listening to my podcast, so they're going to listen to this and be so hyped. They're gonna <laughs> that's, get- I mean, and that's, and that's the support that you – I mean, that's another thing is Jared did that band Guillotine. Yep. We did their first show. 20 people from the school just came to see him and didn't understand what moshing was. Oh, man. Then when we had all the tag team people there when Guillotine played the fest, they stayed for Gulch, and they were like, what the f- – uh, you know, what the fuck is this? You know, like – but jujitsu, you see it. You know, they're going to support everything everybody does. That's one of the best parts about the community, you know? Community. Yeah, it really is. It, un- it is a unifying thing across everything, you know? Can't wait to listen to your podcast. Yeah, right? I can't wait. I'll be listening to every my, – My goal is to, by next Friday, to have all the – on the internet so the first ones release – I just don't want to put out something. I did three podcasts this year that sounded bad. Like I sounded like crap. And I'm like, I don't want it to sound like crap. So we're just making sure they sound good when we release them. Amazing. I'll put up, I'll put up the link on our profile or whatever, man. Oh, thank I really appreciate it. And like, that's the other thing is I also don't think enough people, like people shout out, but we're going to try to make sure on our website link to link the ones we like. Because there's so many of our friends that do them. But I think that people are like, oh, I'd like to listen to a new podcast. But they listen to true crime and they could be listening to – all these different hardcore people that do cool podcasts. Yeah. So. Yeah. I hope to see you soon at BJJ United. If, if <laughs> I hope so. And likewise, I mean, if Jared goes up to do a seminar, we'll definitely travel up just to have the experience, you know, plus I have not been to the Bronx since like 98, 99. So I'd love to see what it looks like now. Awesome. All right, man. Yo, thank you. No, so thank much. you so much. Take care, bro. Yep. Peace. Take care.